unfortunately, Professor Sidhu is sick today, but it gives me the pleasure of welcoming you all again and also welcome you to our very last lecture of this spring, A. Richard Newton Lecture Series. And I want to thank you all for your attendance, for your fantastic questions, and they really have been fantastic questions, and also for participating in the project, the video project. And I want you to know that whereas sometimes I think projects kind of go into, I'd say, some kind of a drawer or a Dropbox, um, your input on the videos will be incredibly useful and you will see them on the CET website because what we're trying to do is build out a website that also features videos of some of the attributes that we find incredibly important in entrepreneurs so that your work uh, has not gone to waste, it'll be actively used. So thank you very much for that. Um, in case you don't already know this, uh, CET and the Newton series are kind of the entry into entrepreneurship. We offer a lot of other classes. You may want to check out the CET.berkeley.edu uh, uh, .berkeley website uh, if you're interested in other classes. The other thing that I had been asked about a couple times is we'll be offering the lecture series again next semester and you can sign up for it again because we have a changing roster of speakers. So it would be thrilling to see uh, who, whoever hasn't graduated back again. And if you have graduated, you can also email me and there's a possibility you can get in still. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to note is that today is our last class and we have evaluation forms for you to fill out. And while this is somewhat of a technical university, it still kills me that it says to use number two pencils on this. I don't think that you have to. Um, but if you could please hand out, uh, complete these evaluations. The format for the evaluations does not quite correspond to how this class is run. So I just ask you to complete it as best you can. And that as you're leaving, please leave it on the tables in the back. And, um, and you can leave them with Rahul. And that said, I wanted to actually thank Rahul, who has been our GSI and reader for the course. And so I know that maybe you all have emailed him or emailed back. He's responsible for making sure that your grades and your attendance is recorded. So Rahul, thank you very much. So today, it is my pleasure to announce our closing speaker of this semester's Newton series, Mr. Bobby Yazdani. And, and I have more, because I'm a talker. Um, one thing that's been incredible about Mr. Yazdani is that his background kind of hits all aspects of innovation that this series really strives to provide. Technical innovation, entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship mentorship. And then something extremely important, and an asterisk which, which I'm sure he'll mention, he's a Cal grad. Woohoo! <laughs> um, he came to Cal in the 80s as a mathematics major, created and sold, I thought, a startup, but I've been corrected, multiple startups, and then began to work at or Oracle. And then in 1997, excuse, excuse me, he founded Saba Software, which is a pioneer in the multi-domain learning management systems. He took the company public in 2000, which is just three years, out, as you can tell from doing your math after starting it. But what's also interesting about that is within a year of taking the company public, it was listed as one of the top 100 companies to watch by Computer World. And also Mr. Yazdani was uh, a finalist in Entrepreneur of the Year from uh, Ernst & Young. So that's a kind of a pretty big deal. Um, the company is still going strong, however, Mr. Yazdani left last year to kind of pursue another one of his passions, and that is more full-time working with venture on, and uh, new entrepreneurs and startups. And in his over 25 years of working with young entrepreneurs, he has, I'm sure he'll correct me because I'm sure it's more by now, but worked with over 60 companies in early stage startups, and he was an angel investor in companies like Dropbox, Uba, Clout, and then I heard earlier today that company, what is that called? Google, yep, maybe you've heard of them. Uh, please join me in welcoming Bobby Yazdan. Thank you very much. Let me open this clippers here it is. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be back uh, to the campus. I haven't been here for a while. <laughs> I'll come back more often. Um, I have put together a series of thoughts, uh, this, uh, for, you know, for you in this presentation. And I'm not going to talk about products, technology. I'm going to really talk about 
kind of my journey as a as a person where I started and uh, you know I've been an entrepreneur for you know not 20 some years and I wanted to kind of share with you kind of how it feels uh, to be an entrepreneur and what I look for when I also work with entrepreneurs and what it takes to be an entrepreneur it's not a, again a technical <coughs> presentation is more about the journey of an entrepreneur I thought that would be more interesting than <laughs> talking about product and technology for an afternoon like this. A little bit of a history about my, me and my background. I was born in Tehran, Iran, and uh, my parents are Iranians, and I left Iran when I was 15 years old. Uh, you know, we had a revolution in our country, and we <laughs> went into a 10-year war, and my parents essentially in 24 hours, they put me on an airplane and they said, you have to leave the country and we're going to ship you to a boarding school in England and that's where you're going to end up. And I didn't see my parents, I think, for about five years. They couldn't leave the country after they dropped me off. So I went to, um, uh, from Iran, I went to, to England. I went to a boarding school, by the way, a Catholic school in Tehran. Uh, Iran is a Muslim country. And, uh, you know, it was also, the, the reason I put all these things up there is because I think these are the things that influenced me as a person and kind of exposed me and opened me up as a person. Being a Muslim country, going to a Catholic school, leaving a revolution and going into a, a, into a boarding school in England and, you know, being away from my family for so many years. Of course, Berkeley was another very important period of my life. I thought, you know, I found, uh, you know, friends here, uh, I found places where it can really challenge me, challenge my mind, um, really exposed me. I learned actually to think about abstract things here in this university. And being able to identify abstractions, both in my personal life as well as my business life, as far as in terms of my, as a technologist, as a computer scientist, was also really helpful. <clears throat> I went off to work for uh, Oracle for many years. I founded a company after I left Oracle in 1997. I took it public and uh, I took it public and I stayed as a public company CEO. I was 35 years old when I was a public company CEO and uh, it was more than what I asked for and it was I wasn't trained for it and I didn't know how to get trained for it. And about two years later, I left uh, that job and I brought in a CEO to run the company because I just couldn't run that size of a company. I didn't have the expertise to run that kind of a company. Um, since, I would say, 1988, I started investing on in other entrepreneurs when I was at Oracle. And then as a, you know, I was a CEO, I started investing on in other entrepreneurs. So I have a very broad set of experience with young companies and young ideas and how they turn into big ideas and big companies. And uh, first I thought I, would, I was lucky. Then I thought, well, maybe I have the instincts for it. And now I have a discipline for it. And I have a disciplined way of looking at businesses and looking at ideas and looking at themes and identifying great people in great themes, doing great, uh, you know, building great businesses. And I've kind of disciplined some of those thoughts. I have many influences uh, in my life, and you know, I worked at Oracle, of course, for 10 years. I saw Oracle went from 600 people to 20,000 people in 10 years period. It was a hell of a ride. It was an amazing ride to see how a company actually operationally can scale how a company takes from a single market, become a multi-product, multi-market, global company, and how do you systematically build a large business? And what kind of a people processes and leadership you put in place to execute on this kind of a uh, growth? And it's not an accident that these companies become great large companies. They have the strategy right, they got the market rights, but they execute better than the competition. It's about winning in the marketplace, and it's all about beating the competitors in the marketplace, and they've done that. Uh, my personal passion, I've, while I was doing all of this, I built a couple of horse farms. I'm an avid jumper, I jump horses, and I've stopped doing it a couple of years ago. Um, I actually took one of the oldest farms in uh, Maryland, it was a 350-year-old farm that was broken, and I rebuilt it. And uh, we do farming on it, and we have horses, and 
uh, it's a really a working farm today. So that's kind of my, my world away from technology and Silicon Valley and entrepreneurship is uh, I love the smell of the animals and the smell of the earth and it makes me a lot of, it makes me human and humble and I love the four seasons. That's why I live uh, part of my life in East Coast. I enjoy actual cold winters uh, when you go back. Uh, the other passion, I've traveled uh, 62 countries and I've actually exchanged money in some 56 of them. <laughs> And I've learned a lot by doing business in 56 countries. I've learned a lot. The business is very different. The cultures are very different. The way people transact are very different. And the way you sell and you talk and convince people are different from country to country. And that's been a great also experience uh, for me. Just quickly, this is one of the areas, you know, I'm an innovator, I'm an entrepreneur. One of the companies I uh, build, I've done a few of them, but one of them is Saba. And um, it started by a very simple idea that I wanted to understand how knowledge gets transferred um, from the source of creation of a knowledge to a supply chain of a business. So I took Boeing. And I followed Boeing and said, how does, they were just about ready to launch 777, which was a brand new airplane. And I wanted to know how did they transfer the knowledge of this complex product worldwide so they get the same quality of service everywhere in the world. I wanted to understand how do they do it. And then it was, of course, millions of dollars goes into it. Many people are involved transferring knowledge. And when internet happened, I said, well, here's an idea. I'm going to take internet as a technology and apply it in this construct of managing competence and skill set in very large <coughs> supply chain. And that's how the genesis of Sova started. And I built this category called learning management system. And later, it evolved to what they call talent management system where you manage essentially skills and productivity of people in supply chain. So that's a category I created. The company is a public company today. They employ over 1,000 people. It's a couple of hundred million dollar uh, business. They have over, I don't know, two or 3,000 customers now. And I'm no longer actively involved uh, with the company. We actually started this company in the April Fool's Day, 1997. <laughs> And uh, this is how it started. It started in the garage of my house, and uh, I just had my first uh, newborn, two babies. I didn't know I had twins. Uh, we, were ex we were expecting one. <laughs> the second one showed up. I had to actually mortgage my house and pay the employees for months after months. I didn't get paid, I don't think, for two years. And uh, I had a young family, of course, and that's how it started. And three years later, I took the company public, and it was, again, a hell of a ride. It was a transforming event for me, uh, starting from really the garage of my house with few friends that I convinced to come and work after hours to help me program this idea. <laughs> and from there, the first customer, the first 20 customer, the first 50 customers, and the list goes on. And it's a journey. It's a pretty interesting uh, transformative journey that I went through. So proud what we accomplished there together with my colleagues and my, my company over the years. As a long history, of, at the end of the day, when I left, uh, it was a, this was a good-sized public company when I left it. Now let me talk about a little bit about um, entrepreneurship and some of the principles that kind of identified over time. And um, Suleiman, who's with me today, he's actually one of the entrepreneurs who was doing his postdoc at uh, Berkeley. And he fit <laughs> into a lot of these principles. And I asked him to start a company together. We incorporated a company together two years ago. And he's going to talk about that company. I think this is a good case for you to see that an idea, how an idea can actually become an enterprise and grow to be an important enterprise. So here's a few fun thoughts of uh, my principles around entrepreneurship. You gotta have a big vision. Don't do it unless you have a very big idea. Is it, you know, don't try to do incremental things. If you're gonna do it, it's gotta be worthwhile and it's gotta be big enough vision 
at, uh, you know, that motivates you for a long time. It has to stay with you for a long time. And what I say is that it has to be a life changer for you. Incremental things is not going to change things that much. If you choose to do it, it's got to be big enough. <laughs> the idea has to be big enough. And you've got to think really, really big. Don't think small as an entrepreneur. Don't try to do incremental things. Go after big ideas, big vision, big changes. Second one that I, you know, I love when I, and I can tell when an entrepreneur can see a future that nobody else can see. It's like when you jump, you can see the hole that you've got to take the horse through. Only you see it and the horse can see it. And the entrepreneurs can see this future that nobody else can see. They can articulate it very well, and they talk about it as it's already happened. So not only you've got to have a very big idea, a big vision, you'll be able to kind of project the future. You don't live now, you live actually in the future. And you articulate that future as if it's already happened. That shows the quality of your thinking, that shows the quality of how, how much you really absorb and understand the kind of change and the kind of idea you're going to have and how it's going to get you know, realized in the, in the future. So now we have a big idea, we can project it out, we can actually see it, and we can see it how it looks like. And we're going to put some outrageous goal to go from here to there. And it's got to be, again, really, really large uh, you know, ideas with really important, outrageous set of goals to achieve it. You've got to go after big targets. And going after big targets, the chances for you to hit it is much, much, much higher than going after very, very narrow. Uh, narrow targets, narrow ideas. Um, what will happen throughout, again, uh, over and over again, it's the most important thing is your time. And time is against you. So you've got to use your time very, very carefully as an entrepreneur. The best entrepreneurs are, uh, you know, they are frugal about their time. They treat time more importantly than their money and how they use and take advantage of their time and how do they prioritize their time. So another thing that's really important as an entrepreneur is to think about how you're going to leverage your time and how you're going to use your time. You'll see uh, that that would, again, translate to yet another important idea is the persistence that you need to have and resilience you need to have because you are going to fall. And there are going to be a high likeliness that there will be challenges uh, that you're going to you're going to you're going to fall, and again, you got to get up and you got to keep going. And there is no way uh, that's that's going to happen once. It's going to happen more than once, over and over again. So you get up smiling, and you it's just part of being an entrepreneur. Is this you know, resilience and the way you actually handle the failures are far more important than the way you handle your successes throughout this journey. And then. The, another key important thing that uh, you know, it's going to make you a great entrepreneur is how well you organize the people and hire and you know, assemble the, the right people around you. This is going to be the biggest area of disappointment for you. People will disappoint you. And that's an area that you've got to, again, have a viewpoint of how you and uh, what type of people are right for you and how you're going to enable your effort with the right people around you. The right people are going to make the biggest difference. And here's one of the key things, is that not only you have to plan a development plan, have, put a plan in place to develop yourself, you have, also have to put a plan to develop the people around you. Because the entrepreneurship, it is a development story. It's a journey of learning. And it's not only a journey of learning for you, it's a journey of learning for your people in your team and the people who come along with you. Another area that's, again, core is that there's no question the markets, the ideas, the competition, everything is constantly changing. What's really important is to have a baseline so you can measure and manage change and pivot from where you started. Because this is, again, a continuous, um, a, a continuous uh, 
you know, enabling the process you need to have in place is how you're going to realize that a change is necessary from the original idea and how fast you can change from the baseline. So the pivoting is another key characteristic that you need to have. How fast you're going to learn and how you're going to pivot and when you're going to pivot if something is not, is not working uh, for you. You know, at the end of the day, entrepreneurship is not about taking risk. You were talking about this movie, the HBO movie. It's, you know, I think it's really sitcom, sitcom sorry. <laughs> Silicon Valley sitcom. I think there are a lot of stories there that are about entrepreneurs who are not responsible. That's at least a few things that I saw. But entrepreneurship is about responsibility. And it's quite different. I think the great companies that I've seen being built are built on, with the entrepreneurs on sort of core values that are uh, quite an important part of the entrepreneur's life and the businesses that they build. They are actually quite responsible for not only themselves, but more importantly for the people in the business and the customers and the investors who are around them. It is a responsible uh, role <laughs> to be an entrepreneur. And uh, you've got to have a set of stated core values that take you to the journey of an entrepreneur. And you know, I don't know about those stories, how true they are, but I've never seen great companies being built not having set of core values uh, with the entrepreneurs throughout those, uh, those very journeys. So I'm going to finish up with that, because I really wanted the best thing I can do is to show you actually a case. You know, and the journey that I started with Suleiman, he is a real entrepreneur. And uh, uh, you know, he, the way I got to know him was through another entrepreneur who I supported, uh, and they were friends. And uh, my principles, I said, I look for big ideas, big change. I look at people who are passionate about the change. They can visualize this future. And I continuously searching for those people to help, to fund, and uh, back them up. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass it on to you. That's one of the things that we do is to support the entrepreneurs and promote them. So here it is. Thank you, Bobby. Um, so thanks a lot for this. Uh, I'm here to. So I, when I found out about this, I, I really thought, okay, so you guys are are interested in entrepreneurship, and you're you haven't done anything yet. Um, and so maybe I'll tell you a bit. I have I'm one data point. Uh, Bobby has hundreds uh, or more, um, but the big thing, probably most of you have an idea, but transforming that from an idea to a prototype and to a business is, is a journey, and, and the trickiest part about it is how you change yourself with every stage, and the answer is always the people. It's always the people. You have to find the right people around you. You have to be flexible enough to, and it's painful sometimes because you really need to break your ego, uh, but you need to learn from them and transform. So just in the beginning, we'll, we'll show you a bit what Ethir uh, is about from on our, our website. Um, basically what, the dream, the vision uh, of Ethir is to, oh, now this, yeah, when, when you're on the, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. It's solvable. Uh, I just need to scale it correctly. Because it's not PowerPoint anymore, right? Um, this is a bit better. Um, the dream is that computing, the digital world, the internet, for me, the internet represents everything on the digital world, you know, apps and whatever. It's, it's becoming, with every step, with every year, it's becoming closer to us. We're engaging with it more, and it's integrating more into our lives. And so the dream is to push it to full integration with our lives, into having full augmented reality all around you. And this sounds maybe crazy, uh, but this is, right, you want to be uh, the full. So this is, this is kind of represents the vision 
of where we would like to go at some point. within a dream, within a dream, right? This is science fiction. One thing is that, I mean, this, this has been there in movies, right? It's not, it's not totally, you can, you can edit some stuff, but each one of us has seen a version of it in some movies. But, but fundamentally, is a very important thing is to realize when, when something is is about to jump from science fiction to reality. And, and the times that we live in, the amazing, amazing times that we live in, things, things, a lot of things are going to make that jump in, in different industries. We're just, there are just so many crazy smart people who are working on so many things. And catching one of those and hanging on for the journey is, is a key. So you start with something like this. It's just an idea. It's, and, and you feel that, you feel it's right, right? And, and then you want to take it from, from something in your mind to, to something that will hopefully change people's lives. Um, and I, again, this is, this is what I was thinking of in November 2011. This is when I, the end of 2011 was when I met Bobby. And, and of course, as a, as a crazy guy, what I really had, what I saw, I thought I had this, right? This, is, this was my, what I was seeing. But what I had was this. I, I had basically just something running on smartphones, on two smartphones, because everything is in 3D, you need them to interact, to, uh, you need two cameras. And it just basically told you that, yes, you can run this detection in real time or close enough to real time, 15 frames per second. Uh, and so you can possibly, there's a chance 
that you can do the interaction in the air on a mobile processor. This is basically what it meant. So starting with the technology, right? This is only a crazy person would take would think this is a anything usable in the real world, right? And then uh, and then you meet a Bobby, uh, or you meet an Argus who connects you to a Bobby. Uh, she's she's amazing in her own way, but 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 it's like that. It is, I mean, again, one data point, but it is like that. Every single important jump that I've had in my life was very strongly associated with meeting one or more amazing people. So can we ask questions? Definitely, anytime. So you have this idea, did you meet this person because you were going to discuss this idea, or did you yes. happen to meet them? So, I had this idea. Of course, I'm totally unrealistic, right? Uh, uh, I'm about how difficult it is to take it to make it something real. Uh, about its, uh, it's about everything. About how much I can do myself. Um, and the first thing that I did, and the first thing I always do, is Google stuff. You Google stuff, you see where the rest of the world is, or at least as much as you can, right? And you don't want to reinvent anything that you don't have to invent. You see where the world is. You learn as much as possible about the environment, right? Uh, and then again, you learn from as much as possible about how to how to take this forward. You read books about entrepreneurships, four steps to the finish, and stuff. And then you talk to friends. I had this amazing, brilliant friend who who had her own startup going. Uh, and I was consulting with her, right? And she told me, you have to meet this guy, right? It will be, right? And, and I said, yeah, I mean, I, I was a bit hesitant because I, I really like to be ready in general. Uh, and so I, I pushed it off a bit until, uh, until I reached this. But again, as a crazy person, this for me means a full uh, solution. Uh, and then I wanted to learn from Bobby. Actually, when I first met him, I'm, I wasn't sure that it was the right time to raise money or something like that. I just knew that this is a person who can teach me a lot about how to take this later, right, to, to the next step or to the end. Um, and basically, that's, that's how it happened. It's, it's about learning. Step backwards. I thought that you started in biosciences and in cancer. Yes. Well, in. Yeah, but pre, how did you. Right before this. But it wasn't like you were working on something that would have led to this. So, or. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, actually, I, uh, I. I do that. <laughs> 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 so, so my. I, I've been thinking about it recently. It's been. Um, uh, it's been a very reflective time, and I've, I've been thinking about what, what has worked for me. Uh, and the pattern that I found is that I'm, uh, I'm curious, and so when, when I was an undergrad, I, had, uh, I was doing computer engineering. I, I got minors in physics, philosophy, and mathematics, right, just because I... And, and through those, I met one person. I mean, I'm this guy in Lebanon who's, right, who has like two dollars a month uh, in my pocket and then i met a person who who got me through the philosophy connection it wasn't planned at all i was in philosophy i argued with this guy day and night about uh, I, we never agreed almost on anything uh, and then this guy got me and um, again it's diverse right it's about doing different things and trying to learn from all of them this is what uh, and that connected me to MIT. At MIT, I worked on unmanned aerial vehicles and some deep math research and on biology. That got me to Berkeley. In Berkeley, I was working on biology. Of course, I was also exploring many, many things. I was working on cancer research, like you were saying. Uh, and one thing that got, caught my attention was, was the Kinect. And I thought, OK, this, th this getting stuck for a you know, for a game is, is unfair for humanity, right? <laughs> it, it shouldn't stay there. And, and so I got, I got curious enough to Google it, to, and then it, 
it went farther. Um, and basically, we're <clears throat> one thing that I wanted to show is that it takes. We have now uh, around 40 patents. We have an amazing team of uh, 20 people, and let me say. And right now, you can you can actually interact with everything in the air through glasses on a mobile processor. This this uses battery basically as much as your smartphone uses there's, battery. You might want to say this screen is what he is actually looking yes. at through those glasses. So there's a wire basically that's display, displaying over HDMI, and this is what he sees. Uh, and and wherever it's black, that's fully transparent for him. Um, right? You cannot project black. Um, and and so these things appear to be floating in front of him in the air. Uh, and, and you can just interact with this stuff. Right? And, and this is kind of, you see this heart and how he's swirling it, and you saw in the vi demo video, in the vision video, there was the golf clubs, yeah. and they were being read, right? This is much closer than two smartphones that basically, <laughs> right? <laughs> Do you have anything on his fingers? Nothing on his fingers, no, no. No. nothing on his fingers, just the glasses. You just right? saw the first tablet that doesn't actually exist. Right. It's the first virtual tablet. Is it no one's allowed to use the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's right here on the device. And, the but, tablet is gone. Yeah. I mean, the reason I have this slide is, yeah. and those slides right after each other, is again, you know, crazy idea, and just a tiny, 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 ray of hope, you know, just, yeah, the technology does not absolutely block you from doing it, right? And then if you have the right support, the right environment, and you guys are, are in the right place, Silicon Valley is unbelievable for this. There's no other place in the world that I know of where you can go with two old cell phones and a piece of paper, and you get this person who tells you his, you know, this unbelievably successful person who tells you, yeah, this is two and a half million dollars, and I will teach you and help you make this a reality. <laughs> right? this, is, this is crazy. This is crazy. But it happens here. Right? It, it, and hopefully it will happen in other places. And so you guys are in literally almost in the right zip code. Right? Uh, and, and again, uh, I'm here, I'm telling you this because I I, w I really want to encourage you to, to look for these people in your life. You plan well, you, you prepare yourself, you, you want to remove the barriers, right? Because these people are very smart and when they meet you, they will ask you, you know, they will see all of the, the things that will trip you on your way and they will ask you about them. So think about those a lot. You know, you hear about preparing a business plan, these people know that the business plan that you write will, is no way close to what will happen. But they want you to prepare a business plan because they want to make sure that you've thought of the steps. Right? So Bobby does not kn knows that you guys, I mean, there's no way uh, it will follow uh, what you have in mind. But having these right people who will support you as you trip and as you fall and as you make mistakes and who will help you learn from them and grow. It, it's literally transformative, like you saw. And, and basically, again, next. Basically, where we're going right now is that we're, again, this is, again, a you know, direction from, from amazingly smart people that you get around the table. So, you meet one person, you, you try to learn as much from them as possible, and then you, you push yourself and your idea to a new level. And then the, the beautiful part about it, or another beautiful part about it, is that you get more smart, amazing, successful people, right, who help to guide you even more and more. Uh, and we're talking to these people and how to approach this market and stuff like that. And, and we're, we're working, we're talking to these huge companies about how this technology can transform their workplace. You know, the PCs did that for accountants, and BlackBerry and smartphones first did that for executives, 
right? And then what the idea was that, okay, immersive computing, as you call it, whom will it touch first? Who is ready to, to be the first person who buy it? Uh, and this is, and we went and, and we got this inspiration and we are, right now we're in these conversations and we're trying to change basically fields engineering where people need to use their hands and also get information at the same time, right? That's the code, that's, that's the trick. That's the differentiation where having a tablet would suck compared to this, right? Instead of, yeah, taking it, doing something, putting it down, trying to work or scanning something. Having it in glasses is, it's not a nice to have for, the, for these people as it is for you. Maybe, maybe one of you thinks it's cool and it's nice to have. These people think, okay, this, this takes away a huge pain in my neck, right? Maybe literally. And in medical, where there are concerns about contamination, people touching different stuff, about privacy, people passing behind the screen and seeing the patient information and all of that, right? Again, they have a pain. And, and you guys will see that, again, you're in the right place, you are learning from, from right people. Uh, and again, I encourage you, people who have done it, people who have, you know, boy style. Uh, and, and of course, the goal is to take it to to the dream. Uh, we we believe it's a you know there's still a way out there. Uh, we've the journey so far has been has been amazing, amazing, uh, and it's all been about the people again. Uh, and and I'm very lucky to be part of it, and I'm very excited about the next step, which is taking it from from what you saw, from what you saw Theo do to something that will change every single person's life. I have very little doubt, very, very, very little doubt that this is how people in the future, at, for part of the future, will use computers, right? This is how you will connect to the internet. This is how you will connect to your friends across the world and stuff like that. It's about whom, who can make this into a reality and when. And this is what we're trying to push. Right. This is another thing uh, for entrepreneurs, and a, a great VC told this to me, that he invests in stuff that he sees are, are a fact of life. They will happen. It's just a matter of one. Right? Um, and this is what we're pushing for. And uh, again, I, it's the people. It's the bobbies of the world. <laughs> And uh, if, if, you, if there's anything that I, you would like me to share, uh, just please ask. So, I don't know a lot about Google Glass, but can you talk yes. about the <laughs> But um, I know it's not a gesture recognition sort of approach. So is that what you would say is your differentiation? So, and or like, can you speak yeah. to that yeah. comparison maybe a little bit? Um, so the way that I look at it that is that fundamentally, fundamentally what's different is, is the use case and the usage paradigm. So Google wanted to create something that is minimal. It's out of your way all the time and you just glance up and see a message from your friend and then you kind of swipe something to send them a picture or something. Very minimal, kind of almost pager-like interaction, right? And they wanted it, and you can see why they went for that, right? Out of the way, we don't interfere with your life. It's as small as possible. What we are going for is freedom. So their, their theme is kind of minimal and out of your way. Our theme is that, hey, if you want to touch something in there, you should be able to do that. If you want to use voice, you should be able to do that. If you want to nod to agree with your friend, right, or to like something or whatever, you should be able to do that. Uh, and it's a very different approach. And because of those, like this, this core difference in the vision, you see how the products go differently. One goes toward 3D, HD, a large field of view. There are these things around you and you interact with them. The other goes, okay, on the side, away from your view, right? It's just because at the core, they're trying to, to do different things. They're, it's the use case. 
Yes, this is actually, yeah. this is actually not so much into the future. I mean, it is, uh, it is planned, and it's it's something fundamental uh, in the vision, right? You will have, you will have everything around you being smart in some way or another, um, and you either have panels for for all of your windows and all of your chairs and all of your cups, or whatever, or you have this portal with you where you can look at the cup, point to it, and you get this digital menu, and you can tell it, OK, keep my coffee at this one, right? Uh, and, and so this is very fundamental. And you're right, you hit it on the, right on the nose. And that's, that's, very, that's very good. You might want to share the example of documents that you can leave in places yes. for each other, uh, and only for you. And you will see, I can leave you a document here a digital document that you will see and nobody else other, can see. Other people will not see that, right? Sharing information or even doing, right? You can take that to, so from documents to interactive things and things that change in time, right? You can have a, a jar and people can come in and put coins, right? Uh, and you can see who, all of that can be, the magic of software, right? Software has this special ability that you make it once, you can copy it infinitely for, for basically zero cost. Uh, and, and we're transforming, like, like Bobby said, he gave the example about the documents. And here you can transform more and more things into software. And that will make them very versatile, very agile, uh, very cheap to, to change and, and grow. Somebody? Either. Uh, I was, I was going to ask uh, if you think the glasses might ever become like, too obtrusive, like if I'm wearing the glasses and someone else isn't, how they could interact and things like that. Okay, there, there can be, I need you to tell me which, uh, which of the two questions are you asking. Okay. Maybe uh, one here. question, it could be that, hey, I have the glasses, you don't, and so the digital content that I cannot share it with you. That can be one. The other is that, hey, I'm wearing these glasses, and they kind of take my attention uh, or something, and so I'm not really in the moment with you. We lose the human interaction. Uh, which second, okay. okay. Uh, that, uh, I, I should be selling you guys, but I don't. So that is a concern. Uh, and we try to address it directly, head on. You don't want to run away from these concerns. and. We believe that this is a societal issue, right? We don't want to force, Athir doesn't want to force, a way for people to do this. And, but basically what we do is that we try to enable you to do whatever you want. You can have all of the content basically disappear and everything when you're in human mode, when you're in conversation mode, <laughs> not digital mode. Uh, and then you can have a direct connection with the people. And the glasses will be very soon, almost literally like, like, like your prescription glasses. Um, but but what, I'm, what I really want to say is that society will lead this, and it will take society some time. You know, there will be some concerns and stuff, and people will argue, and then they will converge on something, and, and people will find a way how to use it, hopefully without reducing human relationships. Uh, or affecting them negatively. I was wondering if you could solve the problem today. So I'm the host, speaker, the announcer, and clowns the deal wasn't here, and he's sick at home. Is it possible that the glasses could solve that problem by him being in a different location and perhaps virtually introducing Bobby? Yes. And us <laughs> physically seeing that interaction? Uh, that, not here. Exactly. That's uh, that is definitely something that we would like to work with. So, in general, teleconferencing or telecooperation, right? The the dream is that you want to play ping pong, or uh, you know, across the the ocean, uh, or or build Legos with people uh, who are in Japan while you're in, in New York, right? Uh, and. And yes, you, again, you guys uh, are definitely uh, 
entrepreneur and thinking of the right things, collaboration and bringing people together is very, very important. Uh, and we're at an amazing time, right? You wake up, you check the news of all your friends from across the world, and then you get out of bed, right? At this time. So can you just so break it down, like how far away your product is from solving that problem, and what kind of technology steps it would take mm -hmm. to get there? So it depends. I'm, right now, I, I cannot read your mind, so I don't know how, um, how advanced you see the solution is. The minimal, the easiest thing to do is something like Skype, right? That's already done. We have tested it. Uh, it's there. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can do Skype. It's not. <laughs> it's not a, right. It's then on the glasses. You on the glasses. Yeah. yeah. Right. So so we can have a person here, and then through the glasses you can see and it looks uh, that 3D, person. Right? Because and then the second step. So the first step is regular Skype. The second step is taking it to 3D. Yeah. Uh, and that you can you can also do, and is is not uh, a problem. Then, if you get to more complicated things, like if you wanted the speaker to interact with something here, right? Uh, and then the the fundamental thing, right? You wanted the speaker to show a presentation, and to and to even turn the lights on and off, right? This is this is a totally different uh, phase. And, and for that, you basically need an infrastructure, a cloud-based infrastructure, uh, for privileges and for the controls and the touches on the Internet of Things. Right? So I have the controls for these, and I, I give the users here, and the users, maybe a user in Japan, but that person is inside this room virtually, so I give them the same rights as the people who are inside the room. So they can access the lights and the volume and stuff. Uh, and we we do have a cloud platform in the planning uh, that is not done yet. <laughs> so given that this is sort of a bleeding edge technology, I was curious as to what some of the largest technical obstacles you've overcome during the process. Well, I think there there were a lot. So so we started fundamentally. Uh, and again, you know, there's, there's this talk. At some point, scientists, uh, according to the models of physics they had, they thought that bumblebees couldn't fly. Do you guys know about this? And, and, they, and at that time, for a period, while science told us bumblebees should not be able to fly, but they do fly, um, the reason people said the reason bumblebees fly is that they don't know that they can't fly. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> And so it's important here to, to start this journey, you have to not know that you can't fly, uh, not, not be aware of uh, all the challenges. Uh, initially, again, I, I tried to, uh, when I was doing the research, the first thing that I focused on is the interaction in the air. Because that, I saw that that was coming, it was at a point where you needed basically a big computer to do it. And the idea was to take it from that and put it on a mobile processor because, because that was a fundamental value that I wanted. I did not want people to sit in a, in a chair and have something huge to be able to use this. But there are bigger problems that, that initially we didn't even know we would face. And these are the, the tough ones. Uh, and again, you solve them through meeting amazing people. Right? And and one such problem is, is that every person's eyes are different. Uh, not only my eyes are different from yours, my right eye is different from my left eye. Nobody's eyes are aligned. Nobody's eyes have the same sensitivity. Nobody has the same depth perception. Uh, the color stuff, it's, it's a huge thing. So myopia is just like one out of 80 things about your eyes that can be different. Uh, and when you wear these glasses, and that, that, has, that is similar to what you see in 3D videos and movies, you know, 25% of people cannot, cannot really enjoy a 3D movie. They, they feel weird or they get dizzy or something like that. Uh, and, and, peop and, you know, somebody, a bumblebee approaching this would not even be aware of that problem. Uh, and then what happened is that I, again, I met an amazing person. Uh, this person is, 
he's a an ophthalmologist, so an eye doctor turned entrepreneur who has created smart glasses and used them to treat people's eyes. Right? So this person uses smart glasses to train people's eyes to work better together. Right? How lucky do you have to be to meet such a person when you're working with someone? Right? It's <laughs> Um, and, and so once, when, when I met Sina and he opened my eyes to this, it was, uh, for a while I was in panic mode, right? Okay, this is huge, we have to cover it. Uh, and, and through his expertise and stuff, we, we were able to, uh, to, in software, personalize everything to the user's eyes. So we basically, it basically gives you a, a quick eye exam. It learns how your eyes work together and how you see with your mind, you do not see with your eyes, right? Your, your brain is combining all of this information and giving you this image. And how your brain combines the information from your eyes. Uh, so we learned that and, and we, we personalize the whole content for that person. So it's challenges like these that were, were the toughest uh, in, on the technology side. Uh, Overall, the toughest thing is, uh, for me, I'm, I'm bad with people, is to convince people, right? And, and deal with people. <laughs> uh, I have to learn that skill. I have to prove that. <clears throat> yeah, how did you pick your team? Uh, I'm becoming better at that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've made uh, some mistakes. Um, and. And so the reason I said I'm becoming better at that is that I'm telling you this is not a final recipe. It's, it's in process and it's improving. Um, the current recipe that I have is, uh, is attitude and then intelligence and then experience. The attitude is the most important. You need to have the person who is approaching, who is in the right time of their lives and the right mindset and the right spirit about them that, that they are really aligned with where you're going, right? They want to go where you want the company to go, right? Uh, the second is, is that they need to be agile. They need to be smart and they need to be able to, to take things and run with them. Things will change under their feet. And in our company, everybody's roles change like every two days. Almost not not that bad, but but you know in a startup you have to do everything, and so they need to be really agile. And then a very important thing is is experience. People who has who have been there. This is the the current recipe again. Bobby would be much better to answer, maybe all of these questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> if, because you, Bobby mentioned rule number six was hiring people and mentoring, and you're a mentee now. So I'm wondering if you could talk about your strategy for mentoring. That's a, I actually, one of, one of the things I've done uh, to, to manage my risk as a both an investor and manage the risk of the entrepreneurs, we have a development plan for our key founders. And later on, we also have process plan for the company. So we show up with a set of recipes that has worked for us to develop companies and develop entrepreneurs by working on surrounding them with the right people so they can continuously benchmark themselves. I think one of the best way to train people is to see other high performers and be able to benchmark their performance against high performers. So we often get them to see other smart entrepreneurs that are further along or they're you know, gone through different phases. That's one way we're doing it. The other way, I bring executives from industry as board members or as mentors that work with the entrepreneurs to enable their businesses with process. Because I think process work and lack of planning, lack of process increase the failure rate. So we are not dumb money, as they say. <laughs> we, are, uh, we think we are smart money because it's not the money that really makes the difference. I think it's the development and the process work that we do with our entrepreneurs is really make the biggest difference. That's our secret sauce. And that's why our, our rate of success is abnormally high. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Awesome. I understand that your union is professional, right? Like board members. What about for us students who are in some of my courses, we have to pick our classmates as part of our team and we have no way of deciding if they're really into the project, they're as motivated, and if they really care about that grade or if they're a senior. <laughs> that, that's my difficulty from this semester, and trying to like, work with the team and 98% is people problems. So, having said that, do you try to find people that you hire at the get-go that are motivated with the idea of whatever idea it is more important than their technical skills? Or? I have, I mean, <clears throat> I go back to what uh, Solomon was saying earlier on. I think motivation and the state of mind, the energy and the motivation is priority. If they, they, those things don't exist, I don't think anything else can work. No matter how smart the person no matter is, how smart or experienced they are, if, if they're not interested in the project and maybe the grade, maybe they don't care about the grade, but they want to do a, a really good project. You're going to have a lot. You're going to have to do the project on your own. So that's not kind of. such a bad yeah. yeah. As well. Well, because I was in this engineering entrepreneurship course, and uh, when my team was cut, we had to be split into other group projects, and we were sold off three and four weeks. And so, when everyone was marketing their skills, like, oh, I'm a programmer, oh, I'm a web designer, all I said was. I'm interested in making pro in project, whatever your idea is, let me join it. I can find resources. You need a VC, I'll call the VC. You don't want to do Google Analytics, I'll find the person who works for Google and do this. And it's only short. <laughs> yes, so there is something there. Bobby is really great at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think you actually you have the right mindset. Well, and I would yeah. not sell that short yeah. <laughs> by any means. And it's the right mindset. Maybe you're, and this is this is very important. And I'm bad at this. Again, Bobby is great at this. It's how to present yourself to show your value, right? Uh, and so some some things that I've observed is that you don't want to be, and this goes also like for dating and stuff, right? Because <laughs> you don't want to be too available, right? It's not. Any project, I'll come and work for you and stuff. It's like, hey, get me the coolest project because I'm going to take it to the end of the world. I mean, you can be in between, right? Yeah, but, uh, but it's this, uh, and this is basically marketing and stuff. Again, I'm not, I'm not good at this. I'm trying to observe and and collect uh, patterns. Uh, well, we had a customer this morning that uh, showed up at our facility this morning. And uh, this is basically one of the premier research labs in the United States. And here we are, we are a very small company. We told them, you really don't have a whole lot of choice because we have only three seats and we're gonna give it away. You don't have a whole lot of time to make a decision. And we, the scarcity drives the behavior. It's amazing. <laughs> so we don't make ourselves too available. Yeah. As a company, we don't even make ourselves too available. So, <laughs> so about your question, there are two things. One is that the attitude, and like Bobby said, you have the right mindset, and you have right. For, for smart team members, you would be a Perfect. great asset. <laughs> but then there's the, the approach of how to communicate that to people. Uh, and, and that's a skill that maybe some people are born with it. I am not. Uh, that's good. It can be learned. That's the good news. <laughs> I was just wondering, considering your background, what, uh, what role or duty do you think uh, entrepreneurs have to, the, to others in the sense that Iran, for instance, is, uh, needs a lot of help? And, and are you, were you in a position to help, or to, to help out or to... To, uh, to, to Iran? Change, to Iran, to... I'm, other yeah. countries as well, other people. So that's it. That's it. So then, let me take it a little bit higher level and then I'll drop down a little bit. So I thought I've, there are different phases that I have organized my life. So this particular phase of my life, I think I can master what I learn as an operator by teaching other people. 
So actually, I want to be a teacher now. So what I'm doing is, is teaching other people what I've learned as an operator of companies. And I want to master my work. And I want to do it for 10 years. At the at age, I'm 51 years old today. Uh, by the age of 61, 60, 61, I actually want to go work for government. And I want to do government work for 10 years and give away all my wealth that I've created. So that's necessary, not this period of my life, I want to do the philanthropy work that I want to do. But I have a plan, big picture, that I want to execute on. So I'm starting to organize myself. I do have a, um, I have an organization that I've set up that has accumulating wealth to give away as a nonprofit. I do support other nonprofit efforts today, but I want to do it in a much different scale and in a much more organized way, as it being also a member of the government and kind of work for the community as a, um, in that way. Now, in terms of uh, you know, what we do today, one of the key things we've done, a lot of the young companies that we set up today, a portion of their equity is already assigned to nonprofits. So we, re we learned that through Mark Benioff when he went to Salesforce.com. And we've seen a beautiful a hospital that they built, Benioff Children's Center in San Francisco, that actually came out of an entrepreneurial effort, no different than this one. That became, children, yeah, this is, it's all related. So it's the, the way we do things now is when I get involved with an entrepreneur, one of my deals with them is I'm not going to get involved unless you put some of your shares into a nonprofit today, because as they grow to become very big, I'm going to help you to give it away. <laughs> OK. So that's, in my way, these are some of the ways I try. In terms of Iran, it's a very different story. That we can talk about it over a couple of years. And <laughs> I can tell you why. Um, you know, it's a very repressive, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of the government. My, you know, uh, my family has suffered through it. Um, Sometimes I feel I'm welcome there, and sometimes I don't feel I'm quite welcome there. And, and I'm an American today, so I have problem at home. So I don't feel Iran is my home. I don't even think Farsi anymore. I don't. I dream in English. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's I've lost that uh, heritage in many regards. So I feel at home right here. There are many ways I can contribute. So my focus is real right here in the United States. And uh, we are very privileged living in Bay Area or New York or Washington, D.C., and you just don't have to go far right here at home, that there are tons of opportunities to really make a difference. And my focus is America, and I want to do what my community is right here. So that's the Iran answer. <laughs> OK. Alex, I, I know you're just about to close. That's so all right. But if I could make an announcement about Design Fest is this week. <laughs> and so if you go to Design Fest 2014 or do a web search on it, you'll find all kinds of opportunities for seeing student projects on design innovation and design for emerging regions. I wanted to thank both of you, Solomon and, and Bobby. This has been incredible. I feel incredibly fortunate that we're in your teaching decade now also. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, and I wanted to thank you all really for fantastic questions. And I hope we see some of you uh, next semester as well. Have a good summer. Good luck on your exams. And again, thank you to This has been inspirational.